Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 11th of July, and actually a pretty quiet week. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new videos and live events. Speaking of which, I'm doing another Ask Me Anything. This is really to celebrate hitting 60,000 subscribers, so a big thank you for that. It's gonna be on Wednesday, so the 14th of July at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. If you have questions now and can't make that, you can kind of go ahead and post it now. Um, it's available and I'll answer them during the AMA. But yes, we'll have kind of this fun little 60,000 uh, in donuts. And yes, those donuts, uh, we did eat them all. Not all on my own, my kids were very happy to help out. New videos this week. So I did a video all about thinking about protecting your environment. Ransomware is obviously a huge deal right now. But I really wanted to explore, well, really ransomware is a type of attack, but the defenses we use are really the same. And ransomware is not just encrypting your stuff. So I really go through all of the different types of impact we may have and how we think about defending, detecting, and then responding to them. And then kind of as a layer on top of that, I did a video about the point in time store capability for Block Blob and all of the different features that actually make that happen. So on to what's new. On the compute side, so a whole bunch of new virtual machines now have the storage burst capability. Now this is kind of the DSV4, DASV4, DDSV4, ESV4, um, FSV2, and the B series all now have this storage bursting capability. So this is free, and think of it as a bucket. So it's a credit-based accrual. I can accrue up to 30 minutes of burst that if I'm operating below my provisioned IOPS and throughput, I start accruing credit and actually start with a full bucket anyway. So if I have these kind of burst, these peak scenarios I have for IOPS and throughput, maybe it's when I start up, maybe it's a certain batch job that runs, maybe it's kind of a, a log on storm or something, I can exceed the regular IOPS and throughput that's provisioned for the VM for up to that 30 minute window or until I run out of that bucket. And if we actually go and look kind of at the details about this. Now it kind of shows us all of these different VM series right here that actually now have that bursting capability. These are all the new ones. So the DSV3, ESV3 and LSV2 had it already. But this document kind of talks about that. And the actual details will vary. So if I go and click on one of these, for example, what it will actually show me if I look at the S variant is it will tell you the regular throughput. So here I can kind of see, hey, yeah, okay. Ordinarily, let's say I can do 6,400 IOPS and 96 megabytes per second of throughput, but I can actually burst now up to 8,200 megabytes per second. And you can see that kind of varies for all the different SKUs. So again, there's no cost for this. It's just part of that virtual machine and a capability I can now use. Remember, also the disks, different types of disks have bursting as well. So those things together can be super powerful and enable me to use both a VM SKU and a disk managed disk SKU lower than I might otherwise need if it's just these very temporary peaks I have. So the ACE V3 has gone GA. Remember, the ACE is the app service environment. This is a single tenant app service. Ordinarily, your app service plans, your worker nodes are just yours, but there's elements that are shared between multiple tenants. That means there's certain restrictions on how I can integrate with things like a virtual network. So the ACE v3 actually deploys no shared components. It all deploys into a single subnet in your VNet. That VNet is dedicated just for the ACE v3. So that means it now easily integrates with things in your VNet or on connected networks. I can have either an external or internal kind of endpoint for those things. 
and I'm going to consume this using the isolated V2 app service plans. Now this new version actually has no stamp fee, so not paying a cost just to have the stamp. It does support Windows and Linux web apps. It supports Docker containers and functions. So I've got this very simple deployment experience now. Uh, it supports availability zones, so that's a nice thing. And I can even deploy it to a host group. So if I think about isolation, remember a host group is a set of hosts that are only used by me. That is not multi-tenant. So I can have this no shared ACE running on a no shared set of infrastructure. If we actually go and look super quickly at kind of the ACE v3, so there's two elements I wanted to just quickly look at. Firstly, it kind of talks about, hey, yep, yeah, the types of things I can run on this. Remember, this is talking about the ACE v3. It talks about some of the benefits like higher scale, um, the isolation, high memory utilization. It talks about some of the usage scenarios, how it integrates with the virtual network. It's telling me, hey, yeah, look, I want a slash 24 for that ACE subnet that it's going to deploy to. It talks about the virtual network integration, some of the limitations. But then also, if I just jump super quickly over to the pricing part of this, the big thing we actually see that is now different is that previously, if I looked at the isolated instances, there used to be a stamp fee. So you can see that it talks about here, there is also a flat stamp fee for each app service um, environment of this ton of $1.43 per hour. If I look at the isolated V2 plan, you'll see it actually talks about the idea that, hey, with the isolated V2, we have eliminated the stamp fee. So I'm not paying for that anymore. Instead, it's really just focused on those instances, and then I'm obviously running um, that ASV3, so they run on top of that. So additional, less, I'm not paying as much money for it. I can run, I think it was 200, I'm trying to see, I made some notes, but I think it was 200 different isolated V2 app service plans on a single ASV3. So I can get multiple uses out of that. But it's now GA. Um, so I get a lot more flexibility, it's isolated on my VNet. On the networking side, so basically for the app gateway web application firewall, it now has this new common rule set 3.2. So this is kind of improved protection from different types of web vulnerabilities, reduced false positives, improvements to performance. Um, so that core rule set just is really just building, giving us better things. I think they increased the file upload limit um, to four gigabytes and two megabytes for request body size. So just some overall improvements there. So that's in preview. Then on the miscellaneous, so there's a new Azure AD provisioning capability. So when we think about the relationships between Azure AD and cloud services, there are times I need more than just a type of federation, be it SAML or OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect. I might need some object on the other cloud service. Now, the way we typically do this is this system for cross-domain identity management, SKIM 2.0. And that works great for those cloud services. What they've actually added is now if I have on-premises applications, it can use SKIM, if the app supports it on-prem, to actually now provision objects from Azure AD. So Skim has these standard slash users slash groups restful endpoints for doing those types of interactions. And if it doesn't support Skim, if it uses SQL, for example, for its storage, it can go and provision to there as well. It mentions in the article future LDAP support, not Active Directory Domain Services, but other LDAP stores. It does talk about being able to provision to those as well. So this is using the regular Azure AD provisioning agent to do this, but now it has these capabilities to actually provision objects to my on-prem systems as well that either support Skim 2.0 or are kind of SQL-based for those user group objects. Azure Lighthouse has added PIM support. So super quickly, the whole point of Lighthouse, remember, is I can think about, well, I have a service provider. Maybe they're offering kind of a managed service provider 
So this is the service provider, and they have their own Azure AD. And then as the customer, well, I have my Azure AD, and then I have my objects. Maybe I have kind of a subscription. Maybe it's a particular resource group. Now, without Lighthouse, I could add users from that kind of service provider as guests to my customer and delegate them right to the resource group or subscription level. But as the service provider, I would then have to change tenant. So if I have lots of customers, I'm constantly changing tenant to customer A, customer B, customer C. It's a fairly ugly experience. So what Lighthouse lets me actually do is as the customer, I can say, hey, yes, this kind of service principle, I can delegate permissions to something specific. So I could actually say, hey, okay, well, this user or this group at this resource group level has a certain role. And as the service provider, as that user, from within my regular kind of experience, I have a special kind of my customer experience, and I'll see them all here. I'll see all the resources I have delegated, and I don't have to switch tenants. My token for my Azure AD will now work across all of these things that I'm lighting up actually through Azure Lighthouse. So it's this fantastic capability. So as the customer, I get a full audit log of everything they do. As the service provider, that managed service provider, well, I don't have to mess around constantly changing talents, changing my tokens. My single token here is going to work. Think of it as basically projecting in those things to my environment, and I can just manage them with my token. So what now is supported, this role I'm given, instead of it just being standard, just there all the time, well now the nice thing I can actually do is I can say, hey, this is via PIM. So I would elevate up. And as the customer, I can specify things I want. For example, I might say, hey, I want you to elevate up using MFA, for example, when you do that PIM. And because it's taking part on the service provider, it's the service provider that needs kind of the Azure AD um, P2 license, not the customer. So now I can actually use PIM with Lighthouse, so I don't have standing privileges. I elevate up to the roles when needed. The customer can stipulate certain requirements about what is actually needed when they perform that. So it's really a great feature for everyone when I think of that. And then, let's get my clicker back. So the app service and Azure functions key vault reference functionality has been updated. So this is all about the idea that ordinarily it might have been using environment variables. So it had environment variables that maybe stored some secret. And I wanted to move away from that. I wanted to move that secret into Azure Key Vault. But I didn't want to change the application. So what this um, Key Vault reference lets me do is it appears still as an environment variable. There's no change required to my app service or my Azure function. So it's no code change for the developer. They're already using an environment variable. It's just now that secret is actually stored in Key Vault. The change is now it works for Windows and Linux applications, and it could be a system or user assigned managed identity for the app that is given permission to that Key Vault secret. It also supports rotation, so when the secret is rotated in the Key Vault, that will get automatically picked up and leveraged. So this is a really nice feature where I don't want to change my app, but I want to move out of an environment variable and store it in Key Vault instead. Well, this lets me do exactly that. And that's it. So I said it was a quiet week. It was kind of the 4th of July. Everyone had a, a long weekend and didn't feel like releasing updates this week. But as always, I hope that was useful. And until next week, take care.